I just don't think that Twitch want to take anything on like that. They don't have the they don't have the, the, the manpower to even start policing this sort of thing before they even want to try and jump into it and start opening this. Uh, there, there's so many options you could go off of if you just start getting involved in sponsors. You're going to have to stay on top of people. It's it's way too much work for, for what Twitch could actually get out of it. Yeah. I, I mean, that it makes uh, any sense. It, yeah. I, I could I could imagine I mean again people don't realize like what how, what goes on behind the scenes um, and for example just how much uh, the Twitch and Riot uh, relationship is um, how close it is so to, to give people an example I, I've talked about this briefly before but when um, when when there was a group of team owners that weren't particularly happy with uh, the Twitch arrangement after they uh, bought and absorbed the Good Game Agency. Uh, yeah. run by Alex Garfield and it was going to effectively put them under this agency and the agency was going to be dealing with their sponsors and everything else and of course they didn't agree to do that there was also a bunch of things where where GGA were going out and trying to acquire players that were on Twitch partnered teams so how can you how can you treat a partner that way when when you're effectively a Twitch employee and this made a lot of people upset and they were looking to move to you know, an Azubu, dare I say it, a YouTube, anywhere. <laughs> just just to show Twitch, right? <clears throat> anyway, to resolve this dispute between Twitch and uh, these team owners, Brandon Beck from Riot Games himself stepped in and acted like some second-rate Kofi Annan. So there, there's, uh, there's obviously a lot of um, respect and trust between the two companies, Twitch and Riot. Obviously, they've kind of grown in tandem over the past few years. I don't know if there would be a solidarity thing, but I would, I would fucking hate it if there was. I mean, that that would mm -hmm. probably be me done with Twitch if they were to do that. I don't think you should be coming in and policing, uh, you know, individual streamers sponsorships or or cutting out where people make their revenue streams from. I mean, keep in mind, Riot do that to the organizations anyway with their morality clause. You know, you can't be sponsored by alcohol companies, gambling companies pornography companies these are companies that want to invest in esports so like you know you can't you can't have logos of a fantasy betting site in, in the, well, in I, the think, LCS. I mean every dev, dev has that mor morality clause in their i think wait it's, what does it's, that mean for renegades don't renegades have alpha draft as a title sponsor or like a big ass sponsor for them or is that just the csgo portion of the team yeah that, that, well the thing is i think it's you can't have any visual logo so it's like obviously when, when you're sending your deck out there to bring the sponsors in it's like we know okay we know you've got an lcs team but we know we can't be part of that so wow hmm. okay well what else, i'm pretty what sure that's gonna... right based on what i understand <laughs> i could be wrong fucking you know, I mean, every one uh, of the devs that that have an esport has a you know, there's some kind of morality clause. It's it might not be enforced as as strict as you know Riot is in this particular case, but um, you know, again, like I I, I remember in Hearthstone or I'm he hearing in Hearthstone where you know we had the the huge team league, right, Archon Team League, and you know they're they were sponsored by uh, was it Alpha Draft? I think it was Alpha Draft they were sponsored by, and. I, I heard they weren't allowed to actually say anything about Alpha Draft. They could actually show the symbol, but they couldn't actually verbally say anything about Alpha Draft. And so, I mean, that's not like obviously a very strict thing because they, they could still show the symbol, but they, they all have some kind of problems with, with certain sponsors, you know, and so some kind of morality clause to, to just being able to, I guess, use their, their game as, you know, in your, in your content and that sort of thing. But anyway, but uh, it so, should be... Yeah. Okay. I like, like, I, I don't, I don't know, dude. I, I, I think I'm working on a real big story that's gonna okay. fucking shock a lot of people. I think when it does come out, um, I, I've uh -oh, another one of these. Uh oh. <laughs> I thought, I thought yeah, you were, I, I, I thought you were, I, I, I thought you were done writing, man. <laughs> no, and I've signed a contract to go and write for a, a, a website uh, that's never written about esports before. Um, uh, that they're, they're, they're paying me a ridiculous amount of money, so I've very much like Dyrus will. I have revised my retirement. <laughs> so. Nice, nice. Nice. All right, well, let's move on to uh, some compendium talk here. And again, this is kind of like, you know, a little bit a week, a week late because we didn't have uh, uh, the show last week. But so Dota 2 announced that they're having a compendium for the fall majors. But this one actually doesn't have any, any um, I, I guess, increase into or none of it actually goes towards the prize pool. You know, which is the first time they're doing this, but the prize pool generally is higher than the base baseline prize pool for um, you know like TI and, and and the other events. 
So good idea, bad idea, just, I mean, for having a compendium, I mean, I, I think that's, I think it's a good idea. I think everybody would agree that's just a good idea just to have compendiums for, and for more events just because they make a shitload of money from it. Agreed? Or... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wait, is that true? Okay, Hold on. Finally, uh, finally, thirty percent of whatever you spend on your compendium goes to the artist who whose work is featured in the treasures. Holy shit! Oh, really? I didn't. I actually, I didn't see that part of it. Is that that is a fuckload of money. That is a lot of that money. artist. You want to be that artist? Yeah. What okay. the fuck? <laughs> Hold on. All right, time to go through the page again. Well, anyways, getting back to it though. I mean, you know, take it. I I wanted to get. I wanted to get your opinions on, you know, basically cutting out that portion of, you know, having a prize pool somewhat crowdfunded, right? I, I, I always thought that was a good idea. I think a lot, most people thought it was like, some people thought it was an ingenious idea for, for Dota or for Valve to basically create this kind of compendium thing. And that would, you know, basically inflate the prize pool to be something just enormous and them not having to, to necessarily invest any money into this. Steven, what do you think about just taking that out and, um, just the concept of, of uh, crowdfunding price pools. I mean, I thought that the crowdfunding the price was a really good idea, so I don't necessarily understand. They want to keep it. Special. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 in the, I'm in the same position. I, I can't really think of any counterpoints I would offer at this juncture. I mean, I'm I'm well into the crowdfunding thing. I you know I, I've got to be honest as a CS well, guy. Yeah. Seeing like the flat out three mil, <laughs> it, it's a little bit a little bit of a kick in the balls, but. Mm -hmm. I guess Valve know what they're doing, right? Well, why, why don't we see crowdfunding in more things? Like, it's not like this is new now. It's, it's been like a couple of years now that that this, that I mean, the compendium was even introduced, and maybe even more than that. So, wh why don't we see more crowdfunding in, you know, from Blizzard esports or from, I mean, obviously Riot's doing their own thing, but even CS:GO, right? I mean, do we see a ton of crowdfunding there? We've uh, well, well, yeah, we do in the stickers. It used to be that we had okay. the cases. That's what uh, that's what the majors were funded off of. We never True. quite figured out what the percentage of the case was, if I'm not mistaken, Rich. I don't think so. I don't think that was ever like divulged. But uh, well, what the, you know, the cases? cases? No, oh, not the signature oh, okay. cases. Like the original esport case it was like the, oh, a portion of that uh, money went yeah. into Valve's pocket, but then a portion of that is, also went into. Isn't it fifty majors. fifty? I thought the cases were fifty fifty. Were they fifty fifty originally? Yeah, I know. I know the stickers. Sticker money is. 50 50 and then between the stickers that, between yeah yeah the so valve yeah so the 50 percent of the sticker mm -hmm. money goes straight into valve's pocket which yeah. is why we raised 8.4 in total sticker sales for the last one 4.2 to valve right and then yeah. out of the remaining 4.2 obviously it gets like what, what the organizations choose to do with that like how they split between players and themselves for the for the logos it's up it's at the behest of the organization for the signature it's got to be at least i think didn't they say it was at least 80 20 in favor of the player i think pretty sure like I, everyone had to sign ndas about agreement. the percentages anyway and i'm pretty confident on like i don't even know how a player can't get 100 percent for his own fucking autograph like whatever but uh <laughs> you know it could be you viewed as a sticker it could be viewed as something that's you could put it in the same boat as the yeah logo. well the, the teams pushed back and were like hey well this, the signatures still have our logo on it and it's like yeah but the player's giving your logo value you motherfucker like uh, that's why this whole thing i mean this is also what uh, what happened with like complexity back in the day with when the stickers were first put in right where it's just like oh but we put yeah. the players in the tournament and it's just like well no the fucking players qualified and got your fucking logo in there for free basically for you i mean there's it's like a back and forth but really, at the end of the day, it's the players who are actually getting your logo in there. I mean, I don't know. The whole thing about, like, orgs taking a massive chunk of yeah. the sticker money away from the players is absolutely ludicrous in my mind. Considering the exposure, yeah, yeah. just the exposure alone that you're getting, having your sticker in a game with, what, 10 million unique players now? 9 million? I, you know, on stream, etc. I mean, like, I can't believe that the, the teams are actually fighting over this. But, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, to quote Thorin, right? Baby. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i mean absolutely. you know I, I i i like here's the other thing as well so i was looking at the numbers for another article i just never got around to writing um and it was like the diminishing returns so before the last major the amount of money that the teams were seeing uh, out of all the organizations i spoke to they said the money they were getting halved each time so the first major when stickers came in it was sick six grilla money up the ass then it halved, then it halved again, and, and halved again. So they were a little bit like, 
the stickers aren't even that big a deal for us anymore. They're, it's certainly a much bigger deal for the players than it is for the orgs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then now, obviously, we have with the signatures and stuff being reintroduced. So we. Uh, it, Game of boost. I mean, in, in in Valve's particular case, you know, they're kind of dev and their event coordinator or event host, you know, at the same time. Is there any possible way that just event organizers could instill this kind kind of you know crowdfunding type of thing, like DreamHack? Could they do this type of sort of thing? Just just figure out some kind of um, offering that's external to the game. It doesn't have to actually be it doesn't have well, to be like stickers and cases. Does it, does it does it have does it Will it, will it work if it's external to the game? I thought one of the big benefits of the compendium was that it was intrinsic to the game. You got stuff in game for it. Well, I mean, that's that's the offer. The, that's why the offering's compelling is that you can get stuff yeah. in the game. But and some people that was could... also put in by DreamHack as well. Like DreamHack had their compendium for Dream League, right? Oh, so, okay, I, mean, I see. It wasn't right. just for you know like the the Valve sponsored tournaments. DreamHack made their compendium. Oh, I see. So make their compendium to turn it into a compendium war, and then it turned into the skins, and then which mm. skin was better, and then timing was everything as well. Uh, like that, that whole thing got crazy real fast as far as you know the compendiums are concerned. Yeah. There was also another model I think that was used by uh, that was used by PGL the first season, if not this last season that that just wrapped up, but the one before that where PGL actually I think had like some kind of agreement with Twitch, where it was like if you if you sub to the channel, then a portion of that money, you know, yeah. like you get entered yeah. into the skin drawing and all this sort of stuff, but then mm-hmm. also a portion of that money goes into the prize pool or something along those lines, something that wasn't at all like related to valve that was actually you know from an outside thing that they were trying to do hmm. uh, cons- uh, considering that didn't happen again I, I guess it didn't really fly too high but but yeah you yeah. know there's there's other options out there yeah will be interesting i mean i, I don't i don't now. really i don't really know uh what what uh, tournament organizers could really do to sort of you know increase like you need to come up with some sort of uh you know good way to do some sort of crowdfunding i mean like there's going to be there has to be some value, right? Like, yeah, there has to be some offering. I don't even, I, that's, that's yeah, I mean, compelling. I don't know. I, I, I still think we're, in 2016, we're going we're gonna to see pay-per-view come back to eSports. Oh, so, really? Wow. Yeah, I really think so, yeah. I really think so. Um, uh, j- just to stop any panic before we get into that, I'm definitely not talking about the Turner League. Uh, but uh, I, I think... <laughs> you will be I, talking I, I about think, the Turner League. Uh, do people think it's like he knows he knows like just because he was there it's like it's nothing to do with it. Uh, yeah. I, I think i think other tournament organizers uh, are gonna look at that model again and to be honest i i think um while i would naturally be adverse to having the game of the people put behind a paywall uh i uh, I, w- I would say it, it's in a much better we're in a much better place as an industry now where i think uh that model would be sustainable and perhaps dare i say it more readily accepted than it was when we had uh, MLG trying to uh, bust it out, so I wonder because we've just spent like what four years, five years, just training the the community to to get everything for free, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? uh, unless you provide some of kind of value. If you, it, if you tie it to a crowdfunding thing, and then let's say you get a pay per view pack where it's like you get a unique drop for in game, you know, like a skin or something. Yeah, oh, like, okay. you so know, basically you, like a compendium you, or something like that. I mean, that's kind of what yeah, the yeah, yeah. Like, could be. Yeah, so for a, each yeah, for each mini pay-per-view ticket you get, you get in-game items. So right. it's like, mm-hmm. you're, and, and some of the money goes to the broadcaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. that, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be terrible, right? It wouldn't be terrible. Uh, I'm not saying I'd support it, but it wouldn't be terrible. Yeah, I don't know if I'd support it. That, that, yeah. that would be one way we could increase prize funds. One way we could even arguably in, in, increase the money that goes to talent on the broadcasts, right? Yeah. You know. But Richard, for that sort of model to work, I think you would have to have some kind of exclusive agreement with the teams. You'd have to create some kind of value there behind the ticket. Because if I can go and fuck off and watch you know, the top eight teams play every fucking weekend and every fucking weeknight, what the fuck do I need to pay 20 bucks, 30 <laughs> right. bucks, 40, 50 for, to watch you know, them play in your, in your tournament? Right where it's like pay per view, awesome. Yeah, when I you know I can just wait ten minutes and I'll probably see them you know playing their next match on some free stream. So the only way that pay per view well, is going to work I, is I, if I you think... can create that fucking scarcity. If you can create that scarcity, then you can take I, advantage. Yeah, well, of it. That, that that is going to happen in two. And well, yeah, exactly. Of just, course, that's going to happen because naturally. you have all these major players like Turner, like ESL, like everybody's still trying to uh, trying to figure out how to, yeah. how they can control these teams and how they can uh, get the maximum value out of them. Well, look, ugh, man, I mean, look, so, so e- e- ESL, uh, the ESL, the SEA Pro League at the moment, obviously, that's a big chunk. 
<clears throat> in terms of uh, how many weeks you need to invest in that. We know Turner are going to do two seasons of 10 weeks each, broadcasting on a Friday. So no chance you're sneaking out for a cheeky yeah. weekend land. That's going to be that's going to be It might as well be exclusive in that case. Right, well, like, that's what I mean. that, that Friday night. Who came Turner, up with that Turner idea? Were very, yeah, Turner were very keen to say this isn't an ex- – we don't want to lock anybody in. We're not going to do exclusivity. But the point is, if you commit to that league, that's 20 weeks out of a year. So – it, it, I think it. I, I'll, I'll say it now. I think it's totally worth it for the organizations that do it. But that scarcity is going to be created. Uh, interestingly enough, the other rumor uh, at the moment is, of course, that ESL are behind the scenes trying to acquire uh, organization. Uh, they want they, they, they have their interest in a franchise. Yeah, like as in like they're, flat they're out acquire the organization, like as in just buying the organization. For example, of, yeah, lots, yeah, 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 and then they would put them into an exclusivity league of their own. They would they would own the brand. Uh, MTG have definitely had talks about buying NIP. That that's definitely happened. Um, that's two different things. So yeah, yeah, talking about buying. The uh, yeah, well, no, 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 not not if not if MTG is effectively the parent company of ESL. Sure. It's not two different things. It looks like a different thing, but it, it, and I guess technically it is a different thing. But how it would work in actuality would be. I you mean, know, you still hey, retain. You may be in a partnership. You may sign a contract to play in X league, but then you still retain control of your team and the decision to okay, we actually, you know, okay, maybe you're not exclusive, but you're still controlling your your team. Yeah. It's a different thing to yeah, sell but, your but, team completely. Yeah, but the, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It would be like I, I think it would be we buy the brand, you all get and, a job to run the the team, Scoots. and that team, of course, isn't going to go to. It's not going to be allowed to enter into the Turner League, is it? It would it would be ESL exclusive. So if you were an NIP fan, the only place you could see it would be in an ESL Super League or whatever, right? Yeah, and there's a quite a, there's a good discussion going on in the chat right now, and Scoots <laughs> is bringing up the UFC as to why you know UFC works as a pay or no, he's saying you know well aren't UFC behind a paywall and you know doesn't that work? Well, it's like yeah, exactly, Scoots. It's completely shut down. They shut <laughs> exactly. down any content that exactly. is not on yeah. their on their behind their paywall. So if you want to watch UFC, tough nuts, spend the money. Like, I mean, that's, there are that's the only way you can watch things. that content. They are free things that they show on you. I mean, from time to time on UFC, it's just not their main. Main yeah. billing, you know what I mean? It, but that's, yeah, they have to do that. Yeah, also, taster, yeah. right? This also mm-hmm. comes down to like your monetization scheme or whatnot. Because like, does does the paywall slow down UFC? I guarantee you, one hundred percent, the UFC would probably have more fans, or they, they would have more fans without a paywall. More people would watch. But mm-hmm. I mean, like, it's the difference between like, let's say you could add, like you could advertise and push sponsors to a million people, or you could sell physical tickets. Well, not physical, but you could sell like for a, a real dollar value tickets to fifty thousand people. You know, even though you're reaching less people and exposing sponsors to less people, sometimes just doing those direct monetary sales to a much smaller number of people ends up being like a huge fucking payout. Oh. You know, aren't like, UFC double dipping as well? Yeah, they're, they they're they're spending. The, you know, they're they're like okay, yeah, buy our ticket, but then also Reebok are going to be the you know the sponsor of the entire thing, and how how much <clears throat> money is going in through that deal? Yeah, I mean, look, UFC's a real bad example. Like, I always get nervous when we start making comparisons between the hey, sports TV. and UFC. Right? Because <laughs> I don't want us to go down that fucking road. Like, think about how... Well, uh, well, even if we don't go down that road, though, like, gonna... there are lessons that you can learn from other mediums of entertainment. You absolutely... Yeah, definitely. It will you to not take some kind of you lesson. You can learn lessons from the like... third fucking Reich as well. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, how... saying, like it's, good, it's good to have those conversations, I think, because, there, like, a lot of that, even even in terms of, like, streaming, like, in terms of, like, subscriptions and whatnot, like, would you rather be streaming to... Um, would you rather have 50,000 viewers and just run advertisements, or would you rather have, you know, like, like 2,000 viewers that subscribe to you, you know, that's, I think that's like a fair comparison to maybe like the OC, right? Where like, I'd rather have the 2,000 subscribers because I'm getting actual cash fucking money. I'm not trying to convert. Um, I'm not trying to show value to sponsors. Like I don't have to build a sure. fucking deck, go out and beg people for fucking money. I don't have to try to figure out how to fucking get my sponsor image and all this. Fuck- like, I got fucking cash money from fucking subscribers. It's money. Cash. Po- so like, Mad what I, thrills, so, like, bro. No, I'm just saying, like, I would take, like, I would take 2,000 subscribed viewers over 20, 30, 40,000 viewers that I have to try to either convert to subscribers or convert some other way monetarily via merchandising or build a deck and show value to sponsors. Like, that's a lot more, that's a, that's a, that's a lot more work <laughs> to, to, to try to, to advertise that way versus extracting direct money from consumers, you know? Well, weren't or, you already or, just or, having this discussion, like, just last week? Or no, well, you didn't have a show last week, but, like, a couple weeks ago, you know, you guys were talking about 
also how hard it is to actually monetize viewers just by running ads like that isn't even worth it anymore sure I, you, you I, have it right there right your sub model buy the ticket well i mean yeah. of course of course you're going to always pick you're going to do a projection as to how much revenue you're going to make in each of those you know each of those different scenarios and you know based on what those are you're going to pick the right one you're going to project years in advance too not just like you know status quo right now right and the thing with UFC is that, you know, there, there's this threshold, right, that you have to pass. There's this, like, critical mass that you, you pass. And when, when, when you have enough following that, that you know, going this more pay-per-view route um, is, is not much of a risk from the standpoint of exposure, then, yeah, it's like a no-brainer, man. It's like, yeah, why not charge everybody another, you know, 20, 30, 40, whatever dollars for, for you guys to watch our content. But I think the issue in terms of esports, maybe we're getting, I mean, I think we're getting closer and closer every, every day to, to reaching that critical mass of where we, you know, we feel like we can charge and then just the hit that we take is not, not going to be, you know, enough that we were set behind, you know, what, just, just taking ads or sponsorships and that sort of thing with, uh, without being behind a paywall. Uh, you know, I, I think we're not quite there is what I'm trying to say. It's like we're still, we're still in the phase of trying to, um, you know, get as, just as much exposure and build that base number up to get to that critical mass. But we're pretty, I feel like we're pretty close though. So, I mean, that, that's probably why, I mean, I don't know the plans, but Richard, obviously you know some plans that are going on like 2016, probably you too, similar. Yeah, uh, right now everyone's and... fucking scrambling, dude. Like it's, it's hilarious because uh, there's even talk about Twitch throwing their hat in the ring and maybe having a tournament circuit. Like, fuck me, mm -hmm. like 2016, it's going to get bloody. Like it's going to be so good. Is it... uh, this is one of the reasons why I had, you know, it's like, Okay, oh. I, I guess I can do one more year of writing. Okay, because I don't want to miss this shit. I don't want to miss this shit. Like, well, is it gonna... is it good for us? Is it good for the consumer, or is it just good for these companies that are just going to be banking? It, it's it's really hard to say at this point because how it's going to work is like you know we all have that mantra, don't we? Competition's a good thing, but deep down inside, we're always a little bit worried that the the people we want to win are going to lose. That's the mm -hmm. downside to any competition. Competition's good when it's offering lots of value adds to the consumer. I, I don't know if we're necessarily going to get, uh, you know, like a, a big win for the consumer in 2016. I think people are going to try more revenue models and, and different ways of broadcasting. And I think it's going to be a bit of a shit show, honestly, until we normalize and stabilize again. So I think we're going to go through a period of flux. I, as I said, I fully expect to see the pay-per-view model back at some point in 2016. Mm -hmm. I think that's realistic at this juncture. We've got mainstream TV stuff. We've got new streaming platforms launching. Um, YouTube, there's one. Their, their model, one of the reasons they've sort of backed out of uh, trying to bring on board esports talent, they were having talks behind the scenes, and now they've eased off, um, is because I think they're looking at it, why don't we just offer crazy money to tournament organizers to get exclusive broadcasting rights of events and if that and, and my sources on that would it, there, there's certainly a history of them doing this when they first started streaming sports games they did buy exclusive rights to certain sports events to test that water so maybe youtube are going to be the first people to to start this broadcasting bidding war we know why mtg wanted to buy esl uh, ESEA, who they've bought, and that's never been spoken about publicly, uh, never been confirmed, but they absolutely own 100% of ESEA, uh, and LPK and whatnot are going to stand down next year. Um, the reason they bought these people isn't because they see them as esports organizers. They see them as content producers. They view tournaments as content. They want to put it on their mm -hmm. TV show. Sure. So there's all, there's all sorts of shit going on right now. Um, and whether that'll pass on and be positive for the consumer... I don't know, maybe. Uh, it's going to be positive for team owners. They're going to make a fuck ton of money. <laughs> oh, so yeah. yeah. That, that's something, I guess. I'd hate to see like two leagues that don't... I mean, I'd hate to see basically the best teams being in different leagues and us, you know, basically an environment like that where there's just, you know, there are competitions split and there's a championship for this league and then there's a champion for this league and then, you know, we don't actually know who's actually, who's the best team in, in the world at, at a given time because of that might make the majors a bit more interesting if they come together for them yeah well but I mean, what, what if i mean assuming yeah, that right of course assuming that uh, the the you're that okay you're playing for one league you're playing for one league but the major is still the major unless 
unless, say, for example, ESL have their one league with half the good teams, Turner <laughs> right. have their league with half the good right. teams, but ESL are the ones getting the major contracts and they're the ones running the major events, unless it's some kind of like third party like DreamHack or somebody coming in who don't have any ties to, to these major players, then maybe that's like neutral ground where they're like, okay, you could go and play in that league. But, you know, who knows if Turner let their teams actually go and play uh, in an ESL run major. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, 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 that has to happen. Val, Val, it has to. Val has to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is yeah. where it comes into, again, like Riot and all that, you know, playing around with G2A and everything. You know, it's just like the producer, the, the game publishers are going to control everything in the end. Like, it's always going to be the game publisher, the, organizer, the organizer, the teams, the players, and somewhere down here, the commentators, right? right. You know, so it's just like... Yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> that's just how it's going to be. Yeah, Valve are going to get the final say, and we all, like basically we all know that Valve are definitely involved. So yeah, I mean Valve, Valve were obviously that that they need to give their blessing for uh, the game to be on television. So you know, mm -hmm. I think we can all safely say they've been uh, in close proximity to Turner on this. I don't. There's no chance. Valve would sign off on something that was going to preclude teams from competing in a major. I think they'll work very closely with Turner to ensure that the schedule doesn't conflict with the major event. Um, yeah. Who knows? I mean, if Turner have the, not... yeah, I was just going to say it's not beyond the realm of comprehension that Turner could even be running and broadcasting a major, maybe by 2017. Yeah. Because yeah. like uh, Valve have said, they want to ge geographically diversify. Um, I, I think their relationship with ESL is not uh, strained, might be too much of a word, but uh, again, my, my sources inform me that ESL are getting a little bit pissed off with uh, the politics of uh, the, the whole politics of talent and, and ESL hiring people and then wanting to use their own employees in finals and stuff. I believe Valve have said behind the scenes that we would much rather actually uh, that politics didn't get involved in the way of a good show. And plus, yeah. like, imagine what Valve are thinking, looking at the reaction to all the talent. That's going to be a clue, and everyone's saying it's the best lineup ever. And then they look over to an ESL event, and it's like D-Man's putting himself in the final again, guys. <laughs> right, right. Have fun. The community love it when he does that. So I don't think Valve like all that negative attention, right? So... Um, I, I think I think Valve would be inclined to look at other partners. I think MLG did a great job in Aspen. I think um, I think they 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 whatever you think about the company, they always put on good events. Uh, that that Aspen event was sick. I think they could be due a major. Obviously, they're going to get bought by a big rich sugar daddy soon. So, interesting times in 2016. Man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, well, let's move on from uh, all of our esports topics here. And there's uh, something that's that was that came up on reddit yesterday and uh it was in the form of a facebook article you know basically saying that facebook uh paid i think it was it says 4327 euros of uk corporation tax in 2014 and that kind of came up right and but something you know discussion that came from it was pretty interesting and this whole term of hating downwards uh kind of came from it and it kind of kind of became a viral thing yes yesterday and I figured it'd be good to kind of discuss this. And again, the frame was that Facebook got away with paying like so little in, in UK taxes because of uh, loopholes. I mean, corporation taxes in Europe in Luxembourg and like UK and other other European countries are very, very low. A lot of, you know, a lot of American companies, you know, incorporate or switch over, you know, to these European companies just because it's, it's cheaper that way. But there are certain, you know, aspects to it that are kind of loopholes, you know, that do help these these uh, companies that make a ton of money uh, basically get taxed less. Uh, so the this Reddit thread I'm posting here, this this comment got like a ton of upvotes, and uh, it basically talked about how the media and even I guess the system or the government and some is this uh, new in any way? It's not really new, but the concept of hating downwards, I guess, is is kind of you know just labeling it that. It's kind of I don't know, kind of Come interesting. Come on, this is <laughs> old as sin. Like, this is just... This is actually um, the book 1984. Yeah, um, true. When the main character um, is in that, like, weird shack with the girl and they were reading that band, like, uh, the band political ideology book or whatever, that book talks a lot about the idea that you have um, the three classes, the upper class, the middle class, and the lower, lower class, mm -hmm. and that the middle class is always fighting against the lower class, and sometimes part of the lower class will rotate out and become the middle class, but the upper class never changes. I think that political theory kind of talks speaks a lot to that. The idea that we're always shitting on kind of lower class people and we're always blaming them for all our problems. But whenever you look at the actual numbers, like 
it, it seems weird that we get mad because, you know, like 2% of all people on welfare might like abuse their welfare checks. But then we give, you know, you got like the $600 <laughs> billion dollar TARP bailouts for businesses and whatnot. And it's like <laughs> we get mad at, you know, like right. some. You know, some dude might be using their EBT card to buy alcohol when at the same time, a lot of companies exist only because they're allowed to pay wages that are so low that we have to subsidize their wages with welfare for people to even make a living. And it's like, yeah, we, yeah, that's, that's definitely been a trend, at least in the United States. I don't know how much it works in the rest of the world because I'm not as familiar with how the debates or whatever go there. But in the United States, we're constantly taught to, you know, demonize poor people or like every poor person. In the United States has the opportunity to become an entrepreneur and an, a millionaire. They're just lazy or they don't pull themselves up by their bootstraps and work for it, you know, so. I mean, this this whole hate and damage thing, like, like uh, Semler says, uh, it, it's definitely nothing new. It's just one of these little buzzwords that mm -hmm. obviously is going to blow up on the Internet. And depressingly, it's uh, it's a term that while, while it's very uh, succinct, actually, in its explanation, it's going to get hijacked by social justice warriors and, and Tumblr <laughs> feminists. So uh, have fun with that. Thanks to that. Um, actually, for, you're um, you're. You're actually late there. Um, <laughs> that hitting upward and the hitting downward is a term. You ever have you ever heard a social justice warrior say white people or you can't be racist against white people? Oh yeah, yeah, all the time. That hitting <laughs> upward, yeah. that's yeah. there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even memeing right now. That's the justification for it. Their justification is that when a white person is racist to a black person, that's actual racism because white people are in a position of power and that's rude. But black people can be white racist against white people because they're using that racism to hit up, which makes it okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. Yeah. Punching up yeah, yeah, punching I mean, up yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's how they describe it. And, um, you know, look, I've, I've heard this argument before. Uh, it's complete nonsense, of course. Um, and this is this is a classic thing that these people do, right? It's like, what's the definition of something? Okay, that doesn't fit in uh, with, with making our behavior look positive. Fuck it, we'll just ch pretend the definition's changed. And we'll just ram it down everyone's throat till they all get on board with that changed definition. But anyway, so <laughs> talking about this specifically... Um, there's a very good reason why it's it's easier to hate something uh, like an influx of immigrants coming into your country over a corporation not paying corporations tax. And it, it, it's very layered, the problem with, with this, how we create that environment. Uh, the first thing, of course, is awareness. And all of these uh, companies, uh, they have huge inf influence on the media. Uh, they regularly have meetings with politicians. Uh, you know, for example, uh, I don't know if anyone saw this, but Facebook, uh, it was, it was Zuckerberg, uh, had a conversation with Merkel uh, um, about censoring Facebook and stopping uh, immig immigration posts on Facebook because the government was catching a lot of heat for their immigration policy. And he was caught on a hot mic saying, yeah, I'm looking into it. So these are the ties that bind. So the idea that then these people would be put and castigated on the media for not paying taxes is hilarious. Of course they're not. They help fucking control the media. And if they don't do it directly, a parent company that owns shares in them does. Right. So it's an awareness thing. First of all, it's never going to be on the news. Like we get the odd little snippet to say that it happened and then everyone goes up, oh, but it's not a massive blanket coverage thing. And it gets shut down pretty quickly. Uh, I'm trying to think there was a, there was a newspaper in the UK I want to say the Telegraph, but it might be wrong, um, that had ties with HSBC uh, Bank and uh, was, was sort of glossing over a scandal over there because they need the money to stay afloat. They need the investors. The media got bought decades ago. It cannot be. You can never have a true, open, um, you know, kind of mainstream media anymore. It's owned. So that's problem number one. Problem number two how does a guy like me, a guy like you, how do we stop a massive corporation from uh, fucking us over? What do we do? Don't use Facebook? Are we winning now? Is, is that what we do? Well, no, you can't do anything about it. You yeah. literally can't. You can vote with your feet and not use their product, but there's a million other motherfuckers who will. It's kind of like democracy. The idea that your vote is really important is a myth. It's an illusion. And if, if, if at any point we found a way to operate outside of the Western democracy, a hierarchy how it works they just change the system <laughs> so there, there, there's there's an entrenched uh power base that you cannot overthrow unless you're willing to have a violent revolution history teaches us this so i don't want to go all crazy and say hey <laughs> you you americans live in a nation where you have guns you keep saying if you ever have a tyrannical government you're going to use them to overthrow it well that time's long past but whatever 
I'm definitely not going to go into that argument. Uh, let's just talk, <laughs> uh, that's let's another just talk old about. One. Yeah, exactly I mean, right. But let's. let's Stephen just, just might block how... up, you know. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, let's let's just talk about how uh, it's far easier to actually like I, I I as an everyday guy, if I was so inclined, if I was a bigot, I feel I could maybe stand with a placard and link hands and stop immigrants coming off the Channel Tunnel. I could report immigrants if I saw them in town and get them arrested and taken away. I can go out and be angry about that and feel that I'm having an impact, in, which in their fucked up brain obviously is positive. Uh, on their locale, the results are instantaneous. It is the illusion of power. But you are only allowed to affect change over things that truly don't matter. That's just how modern Western society works. There's too much money involved for it to operate any other way. Now, the, the final point as well uh, is taxation. Uh, David Cameron recently gave a speech saying um, people who don't pay their taxes and benefit cheats are one of the reasons why Britain is no longer great and one of the reasons why Britain is a problem. Well, hilariously, not only is he allowing corporations to get away with paying ridiculous amounts of tax using loopholes their government could shut down tomorrow. This is a guy who takes housing benefit on a house. Uh, when his uh, kid was uh, ill, he claimed a bunch of benefits he didn't need. Obviously, he's got a six-figure income uh, and is, is worth, I don't know, I think his estimated value is six million pounds. Um, so he's a multimillionaire. And he himself has used benefit handouts that he didn't need. And this all came out in the papers. And what are we doing about that? Not a goddamn thing. So One of the big problems with things like this. How do you and change like, it? I, got a, I actually got into a huge argument with somebody on Twitter over this like just a week ago. One of the big problems is that um, th like everything is so convoluted that it makes it really hard for like a normal person to talk about any of these issues. Um, like One off-sided thing is that like when you talk about like taxing companies in the United States, a lot of things conservatives like to bring up a lot is the um, corporate tax in the United States is the highest in the, in the industrialized world. Um, and if you look at the actual written rates, they're correct. It is. Our, our business taxes in the United States are the highest in the, in the first world. But the problem is nobody ever nobody pays the nominal the the listed fucking rates on any taxes. Like even if you're like a normal citizen, you don't just pay straight federal income tax because you have to take into account a whole bunch of deductions. Um, if you itemize deductions, like things look a lot different. If you have dependents, if you're filing married jointly, um, if you own property, if you're getting paid um, based on investments, if you're contributing to a Roth IRA, like there are all of these different types of things that change the way your particular tax um, situation looks up. So the effective tax that you pay as an even as an individual individual and especially as a corporation is always going to be monumentally lower than the nominal fee listed so it's really hard like all of these conversations it's like you almost have to be like an expert in fucking tax law <laughs> in order to even have a conversation about like do you think because because I, I, I noticed that happens a lot like whether I'm looking on reddit or whether dumb fucks are shouting at me on twitter whenever you get into an argument about um Whenever you get into an argument about taxation, um, people are always so quick to throw the nominal rates at you. And it's like, that's the, for me personally, like if I see somebody throwing around nominal rates, like I know that like this person has no idea what they're talking about. It's not even worth arguing, but you see tons of people will upvote and agree with people who are, who are talking about nominal rates when they're completely and totally arbitrary and mean absolutely fuck all in the real world. Like, but that's not even like a fault of like the, the people who argue about it. It's just like so insanely fucking convoluted that yeah, I don't know. Those are, those, it's like a really difficult topic to approach when it seems like you have to know so much just to even begin to talk about it, you know? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. This is okay. potentially the design. Yeah, <laughs> right. The well, why. and that's the argument is that it's, it <laughs> exactly. is... Does that like you, you rich by obscurity of fucking tax law or whatever? Yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, some people would argue that the reason why the design is so complicated is to make it so that you can navigate your way through the complicated tax waters. And yeah, yeah. but getting back, getting, getting back to my point about the media coverage of it, uh, there's a lot that we, we, we talk about over here in, in the UK about how we, we, we're super lucky because we've got this open uh media and we've got it we've got a, a effectively a state funded broadcasting corporation in the form of the bbc uh what they have they have a relationship with the government which means the tax that we pay to have broadcasting equipment in our houses is given straight to this broadcasting company to create independent news now hilariously i, I can see straight away how that's a conflict of interest because any government can turn around and say okay well we're just going to take that tax back and you don't get to pay anyone anymore. You know, that, 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 that's the biggest part of their income. But it, the, the idea is it keeps them free from having to run commercials, keeps yeah. them free from corporate interests. This is the same company 
that when David Cameron was revealed in a biography from uh, a, a rival uh, politician to have fucked a dead pig while he was <laughs> at university, the BBC wouldn't report this story and still haven't. Uh, but it's been in other mainstream media outlets. Yes, uh, that, that's the kind of things the, the, the nouveau riche get up to in, in the UK. But it was back when he was um, part of um, the Bullingdon Club, which is a, um, a, a group, you know, from um, Oxford, if I remember rightly, I, th- I think it's Oxford he went to. Uh, but anyway, yeah, they're a, yeah, they're a group of elite. In fact, people who are in the, the cabinet, uh, let me just double check because I don't want to get it wrong if it's Oxford or Cambridge. So, um, sounds like, sounds like they have some fun pastimes there, man. Uh, yeah, it is Oxford. So it's the Oxford University. Now, the Bullingdon Club membership uh, is, is basically made up of people who are in, like, you know, the fucking cabinet or high up politicians right now. You've got, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think who was there. George Osborne uh, is in there. Boris Johnson was in there. Um, there was uh, some other people, like, uh, uh, just prominent politicians and prominent people. And, of course, th- th- they used to do ridiculous things. Like, this was re- uh, recounted in... Um, someone else's bi- biography that basically they used to smash up shop windows and then when the owner would come down they would just give them money and say like fuck off and they would just do things like that they would burn to join the Bullingdon club i think you had to burn like a 50 pound note in front of a homeless person so these were like horrible <laughs> disgusting wow. reprehensible people okay. and they're, they're, they're now in in charge of the country obviously and i find it hilarious david cameron is the same guy who said We've got to send uh, people who were involved in the Birmingham riots. We have to send them to prison for a long time to set an example. And you had ludicrous examples where people went to prison for six months for stealing a bottle of water from an already smashed smashed shop front uh, to send a message. The same week those sentences were handed down for the rioters, uh, the media missed that a bunch of politicians who've been caught embezzling money, public money, and using it on frivolous expenditure, they had their sentences cut, and they were released from prison about five months early. So are prisons owned par- privately, real quick. Just our prisons owned. We don't have that. We don't UK? have that in the UK. We don't have. In that the United in States, there are private prisons, but yeah. Mm-hmm. So are we the only? Yeah. Are we the only ones, Stephen? Or or is it like? I'm yeah. not sure. There. I mean, in the UK, how does that run? Because that sounds like a pretty good money making scheme. But I think yeah, I think it, yeah, it would be. There's such a shortage in space right now. It's crazy. Sorry, Rich. I didn't. Well, the reason oh, there we go. There's 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 the there. space is because some of the uh, people that run the private uh, jails make deals with the mayors in neighboring cities in order to ensure that they meet like minimum conviction rates and whatnot to keep the prisons full. Otherwise, the private prisons uh, threaten to shut down. Wow. Really? They're, yeah, these there's are like quotas. Actually, it's not even kind of yeah. But even even the writing so tickets, so whatever cops have led. I, I just, I like just so want to offer a correction for the benefit of the vod. Sorry, uh, it was it wasn't the Bullingdon Club he fucked the pig for. Uh, it was Pierce Ga- the Pierce Gaveston Society, so another secret society that uh, this British uh, politician was in, and 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 again, you know, like I say, BBC, we're not going to write about that. So yeah. if, you, if you think you're going to get away with, with them uh, writing up, writing honestly about corporations, basically just subjugating us all, so while we live in a time of austerity and taxes are going up and benefits and essential services are, are getting cut and going down in, in frequency and use, meanwhile corporations are posting record profits, paying the lowest amount of taxes they ever have. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting that all of that's going on and yet, you know, fuck it, the immigration crisis is on the front page every day. Yeah, exactly. Of One of the, um, another another problem is the, like, the widespread, I remember that somebody, the, how widespread these companies are. Somebody on Reddit posted something where they're like, if you don't like these companies, then, you know, vote with your wallet. And they posted a list. Oh, this had to do with the, um, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Um, do, oh fuck! Does anybody have a list of all the companies involved in that? I'll, I'll look for it. Hold on. It's 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 staggering. It's like have you you've seen like the the um oh here it is. Hold on. Some so somebody made a list. If you wanted to boycott the people that were involved in um in this trade agreement, these are the companies. The link is loading. These are the companies that you would have to boycott. Good luck. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, there's a text. Oh, here we go. 
Yeah, this is pretty yeah. much every yes, company every in life. America. Isn't oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, keep in mind that a lot of these companies own smaller companies as well. Like you know how large like the Nestle yeah. brand is fucking yeah, exactly. huge, right? You know, like Nestle owns a Coca-Cola, fuck ton of shit. Jesus, you know, yeah, wow, it's a lot of them. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Worst thing is, some of these companies own like essential services, like you see. Yeah. pharmacology companies in there you know like mm-hmm. how do you boycott medicine if you're sick do you know what i mean yeah it's like this is what i'm, this is what I'm talking about like the the the, the corp you know, this is very much it's only just got worse like the last 50 years uh the levels of corporatism um so and the people forget as well I, I think isn't it the definition of fascism is when a government acts exclusively with the interests of like corporations Pretty pretty sure that's how it started out, according to Mussolini. Anyway. Yeah. Um, exactly, yeah. Whatever. All right. Well, let's uh, let's start taking some questions here um, from the viewers, guys. If you want to post now, see it. if we had this TPP deal, wouldn't be going through if we had Trump to negotiate for us because Trump wrote. <laughs> Trump wrote it. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, Other yeah. fucking Trump. That's his book, God. dog. It's, yeah. It's as long as Trump yeah. gets in, the only oh, people that need to worry are those rapist Mexicans. Right? <laughs> oh God. Fucking Mexicans, man, raping everybody. God damn. Hey, some late breaking news from Arsenal, Stephen. Hell yeah, I Did saw that. that? <laughs> Get fucked. Absolutely <laughs> fucked. That that was an over right, yeah, Somebody just, wrote in the forum that uh, Blizzard has a one hundred percent kill rate on um when they go for nerfing cards. Yeah, Grim Patron is fucked. That War Song card <laughs> is nerfed into non. How many fucking? I'm I'm sorry. I might be really ignorant. How many fucking charge minions does Warrior even have? Can you name some? Charge I know they have minions? that huge Corcron. one like the Corcron and Gromash. No, Corcron, yeah. Corcron's four three. Gromash, or Gromash, and that's it. Everything. Oh, or they have a charge. Card. They have a charge spell too. They can make anything charge, right? Yeah, I guess. But like, yeah, yeah the the that the new War Song is like out of decks. Like, so I'm surprised Blizzard sh- as part of the patch. Like, Blizzard should just automatically re- remove War Song from like every single deck, so you don't have a fucking heart attack when you play it and see that it's a fucking <laughs> dead card on your fucking board. No, they they, they oh, pulled they shit. pulled a yeah. They definitely pulled a starving buzzard on, buzzard on this card because this card will never, ever be played. For those of you that don't know what we're talking about, there's a there's a crazy strong deck that's in Hearthstone right now called the Grim Patron. It's deck, only been the best it's... deck in all of Hearthstone for like the past like what six months. Oh, that's the thing I can't that really long, believe. Long, that long. Long. Balance it like yeah. uh, <clears throat> as soon as Grim Patron came out, everyone was fucking complaining and like they had. This shit's fucking. Well, it took a little while. It took a nervous. little while for people to actually figure this deck out, but then once it figured out, it was. It's yeah, just once a... it got figured out, people got pretty mad about it. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing about this deck has been it just made the the events and you know kind of the highest level of of Hearthstone just really boring. <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> well, there's two huge problems. One is lack of counterplay because of one turn kills. If somebody has everything in their hand, yeah. then you die. Yeah, right. But Everybody's that's... seen the screenshots of the ridiculous boards with the fuck tons of taunts up where it's like, oh okay. And then the only thing standing at the end were like two of the um froth was it the, is it the frothing berserker with like fifty two fucking yeah. attack each or whatever. And... Yeah. And then the other thing is um the the uh patron deck is like ridiculous consistency because none of the warrior cards <laughs> are fucking RNG. Nothing is RNG about warrior. Everything is like a death rattle, one damage to all execute. Is if it's taken even one point of damage like it dies like every single part of the um deck is like amazingly consistent like yeah well you know we've been i think the community has been complaining for a while. the players have been complaining about this deck for a while so it, it's it was just a matter of time that they finally did something to it and is this the right change i don't know if it's the right change because it's it feels like a death sentence basically <laughs> like nobody's gonna play War Song Commander ever again? Yeah, and Brawl is but Brawl isn't in Patron War, you fucking piece of shit. Sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, it's not a bad yeah, thing. They've they cards Brawl before, like, you know. Wait, she's Brawl in Patron? Some, some, I think some people may add one, but. Oh, I, maybe, yeah, sure. But it's not. I don't think it's an important part of it. No, it's not an important part of it. No. You see a more in control like warrior, but sorry, good. I was just going to say, it wouldn't work? be the first time they've completely killed cards. Like, the Starving Buzzard, like. I no, I mean, every time they nerf, almost every time they nerf, the cards. Like Leroy Jenkins and Tigmaster and Buzzard and it just for the most part <laughs> it's completely removed from from the game. What is uh, is there like a full patch note or is it just this? Yes. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, this is the pa- this is the upcoming balance change. This is the uh, this so Zer- Zeraya is the community manager for Blizzard, so this is oh. the official announcement of it. 
that okay so it's just this one change that's going to be made there isn't anything else no so i'm, it's, I'm worried it's, about my like demon handlock no nothing's going to happen you know, it's, it's like literally patron it, warrior is fucked that's that's exactly what okay. it is yeah okay. yeah Don't all right let's take some questions here from uh the viewers and if you guys want to post some like while we're doing this you can and chainmanv.tv there's an unfiltered number 69 post you can just put your comments there or you can tweet it too that would be fine too um Okay, so Rad Radislav Nachev asks, what needs to happen for heavily commu heavy community moderated community forums to become popular in esports again? I said again, I'm new school, so I assume there, there were forums like that before, and be competitive with Reddit. I know HLTV exists for CS, but that isn't exactly heavily moderated, high level discussions from my experience. So yeah, HLTV so is one of those sites like Team Liquid that just kind of survived off of its existing user base from before previous user base before yeah, pre-reddit type of thing yeah and then they get here's, here's the thing though like, well, every now and well, again and there this, you go this guy's basing his whole argument on a fucking faulty premise to begin with what sort of question is that heavily moderated forums don't survive that's the point right people get pissed off about it and fuck off and go somewhere else isn't something awful pretty heavily moderated i'd like to see what traffic they're doing well, they get paid for though. They go the UFC route. <laughs> <laughs> is that, don't you have to pay five bucks or whatever to have an account on the site? Is it? Don't they still do that, or did they stop that? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't even looked at that site in years. Yeah, I don't. I'm Create not sure either. something awful account. I will find out. Don't worry. I mean, may, maybe we kind of redirect this question to being: it, Will will there ever be community sites that are going to be more? Uh, more of a central place for a particular esports slash game than than Reddit because Reddit does facilitate that need at this point in my yeah. opinion. This this is the problem, right? This is the problem. Okay, so everybody says we want a heavily moderated site with quality discussion because they never think they're going to be a retard. That's the problem. <laughs> but when you're a retard, you you're not capable of critically realizing you're a retard. That's pretty much the whole problem for this esports. Dunning Kruger, yeah. There. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Like you don't think I'm I'm the moron. So what happens is when you do something and you get moderated, you go, "This is a fucking outrage." <laughs> Nick, how can you moderate me? I wanted a heavy, heavily moderated forum, but not me. I wanted the other retards, and then everyone's like, "Bro, you're the retard." <laughs> no, 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 this can't be right. So then they start complaining about it. Then they start making accounts to bypass the ban, and then you ban those, and then they're going, "This is censorship. This is so this is so egregious. What are you doing?" We're like, no, dude. You're just being a retard. Take five minutes, come back. Don't be a retard again. No, but this is an outrage. And then they whip everybody up. And then you get a cluster of retards. And before you know it, like the retards are really good at convincing other retards of retarded things. So before you fucking know it, now you've got an angry mob of retards. And then they go somewhere else and they go, hey, isn't it great here? We're free to be retards. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's the principle HLTV operates on. It's worse than Twitch chat. And yet it calls itself a forum. Has an HLTV user ever had a thought in his head and not made a thread about it? Like, if he has, I, you know, let me know. I'd like to see it. So, yeah, fuck him. You, you can't, <laughs> nobody wants a heavily moderated forum. Nobody. Isn't that why Reddit's like meant to be like dying on its ass right now? That they're censoring shit? Like, what are people, fuck this. It's, it's a ridiculous question. <laughs> All right, Chan, man. Hit us with something else. <laughs> All right, I'm looking for. As a retard, I would like you to apologize to our community. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. oh, man. Okay, so Kenneth Franca asks, how do you guys feel or how, how do you guys feel about E Olympics? Yes, there is TWC and CSGO, but I couldn't name any competition in another esport where people compete in national teams, which I would like to see, especially under one banner, since it's more unlikely that a company cough, riot cough, would refuse to join in them would join in then especially if it would be under such a big name as the olympics i don't think we are big enough for that but i'd like to have have one under that name okay so what do you think of the concept of creating i guess in you know just an olympic organization slash a huge event for every game uh, i don't think you would ever get the developers on board with it would you well it's also like i think you could you i think you get a, a a group of developers that, that would aren't all of these tur no i don't know if that well like all of these tournaments they're kind of like already olympics right in a sense just because like you know starcraft 2 you had like the koreans versus the non-koreans so well no 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 yeah, what he's saying what he's saying is or, i think he's saying 
having a tournament where all the different esports are yeah, involved. Yeah, like, like we're we're talking. Ah, yeah, okay, we're talking so about a global single event. event right, yeah, right, global right. event like. Yeah, WCG yeah, kind of, or you know, kind of used to just yeah, just a well, global event that that um you would represent you would your to, country. Yeah, you would have to brand it that way. The problem is like, it's a huge endeavor. Whatever. I mean, it would take a yeah, lot it would be of like investment. A massive endeavor. Yeah, but would it be cool? Yeah, I think it'd be cool. And we were talking about it a little bit earlier that, you know, just with the the the, the world championship that Richard was at, that I, I think representing your country it hasn't been explored enough. At least hasn't been executed successfully. Uh, from the way yet. that I see it in CS:GO, at least because CS:GO is, is might, might be mm. a bit particular because a lot of the teams are already just like that national nationality, right? Apart yeah. from France, where you get some mix over Belgium, France, right? You know, oh, so, sure. yeah. right um, in the CIS regions as well, Ukraine, Russia, Navi comes to mind. But uh, for the most part, you know, TSM, Danish, Fnatic, Swedish, Nip, Swedish, and one Finn. Uh, so you had these sorts of situations where it's just like it already kind of feels like a, you know, a, a national engagement where it's just like, OK, this team is French. They're winning everything right now. France is the best team in the world. What's up? And th there was never really or there's never really been a draw for me to say, oh, we need an Olympics, because as far as I'm concerned, it's like TSM are stomping everybody's face in right now. They're Danish. Denmark are the best in the world. And it kind of just wraps everything up in a nice neat package with a bow on top. So. Yeah. But maybe that's just particular to yeah, my views about know. CS and how CS is or is already very like at the last major we had teams singing like we had a huge cheering section just for the French team singing the Marseillaise in the in yeah. the in the in the in the, uh, the grade in the uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, the stands. So I mean, um, so I, I don't that, know. that I, element is already there as far as I'm concerned. It, it is there to an extent, but I think having just full out country representation allows for even folks that. You know, more Who casuals. cares about NA scoots? Sorry. I mean, it allows for more casuals, like people that don't follow CSGO scene, they just happen to flip over to that. It allows them to, like, by default, just root for a team. Like, you know, I've watched a sport before, like when the Olympics are on, right? I mean, like cross-country running or something like that. You know, I don't know jack shit about that sport, but whenever there's American on, I'm going to be rooting for that person just by default because that's that's my country. And, you know, you could have a little more of that that sort of thing when it comes to, you know, some of these events, too, if, if you just had more national teams versus, you know, just the club teams, I guess you could say. NA 010, never forget. Oh, I mean, NA God. has got, like, they want to throw away all this shit about the Olympics as fast as possible because they can't fucking win a thing in any game. Well, true. So, you know, yeah. leave these guys out of it. Let them make their money over on the side and maybe, you know, feel the team every now and again that can actually do something, like maybe make it halfway. But they're <laughs> never going to win anything, so why bother if you're a North American team? I can't. I hope that one day, like, NA does so fucking well at World <laughs> so that I can see how fucking mad Thorne would be on Twitter, how salty he would be at all, like, fucking... <laughs> Right, CLG fanboys that are oh my I mean, god! NA, no. we, we didn't we have an NA? We had an NA team win the international this year, didn't we? I mean, no for league. Oh, for league. Okay. Right, uh, I think I Thor. Check like, metal like, imagine like how much like Richard Lewis hates um, Riot. Thorin hates like TSM and NA fanboys in general like a million fucking times more. Like He's, you can't. To, to be to be fair, he hates all ah! fanboys. Oh, he, <laughs> he does. does. He does. That's true. Sure, like sure. NIP That's fans fair. as well. So. He's got a list that like, and I, I get it, you know, like, because fans by definition are very often irrational, but some fan bases are way more irrational than others. Sure. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I understand why it can be irritating to him. He's got a great hashtag on his tweets, like hashtag fan logic. And he like, yeah, yeah. Take, like <laughs> I love it. It'll take like when an American team loses, he'd be like, you know. Oh, but we should have won that because all these things didn't go our way, and it's like ignoring the fact the other team also had that, you know, sort yeah, of exactly. stuff. So yeah, he's, sure. he's, he's pretty good. Or was like, comp or, or or somebody was like, um, oh well, um, we're Thor the fucking four panel comic where Thorne's like, oh, what a cute dog, and the guy's like, you yeah. know, this <laughs> random EU or NA player um, might not be as good with Faker at one hero, but he's got a more diverse pool of champions, and like Thorne's like, oh, he's retarded, like, <laughs> <laughs> like that. oh god. So can somebody find that tweet or whatever? Uh, oh, that was probably man. like one of the fastest tweets from Thor, though, where he's just like, let's count how many teams are coming from each region into the, into the top eight, right? This just goes down the list. EU, two, three, whatever, Korea, three, China. And it's like zero, NA, you know? <laughs> right? It's a, which is the top seed again. Like, he was so fast. He was just waiting for it. I mean, yeah, what are you talking about? Duncan has it. like 10 zingers in a row constantly on, on Twitter. They, they, you can't keep up with that guy. Exactly. It's like, I want to put him and James Harding in a room together and let them go at each other. That would be pretty be fucking crazy. crazy. One day, one day. 
Mashai Sprafka asked, uh, I got <laughs> one of these tweets. Maybe uh, Hi was just signaling to Febben, yeah, yeah, uh, Febben how many dimensions and comp style C9 have, but used the wrong finger. <laughs> I saw that. Sorry. All right, I got a question regarding Korean SC2 scene. What do you think will change in GSL with Africa.tv buying out Gone TV? A lot of awesome esports memories of GSL. I have no major changes happen. Yeah, so that's one of the things we were going to talk about last mm -hmm. week, but unfortunately, we were able, to, we were missing it. So Gone TV obviously is exiting esports, and um, you know a lot of people are concerned too because that that means GSL. Where's GSL going? But then Africa.tv or there's an announcement that Africa's just kind of taking it over. So is this going to change? I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no telling if it's going to change anything at all. But GSL, I would assume that they're going to try to keep it as closely, I mean, intact as as much as possible, given that that people like it, right? But Gom leaving is a is a big deal. What are you laughing about? <laughs> I, just, I just saw the Twitter. Oh, you saw, oh, you just saw, saw the Twitter. Twitter. I, saw, I saw that like this er, either early this morning or late last night. I can't even remember when I saw it, but oh, <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, oh, Gom Gom leaving. Uh, or <laughs> right, sorry. what do you think? You think GSL will change, Stephen, at all or no? Um, I don't. I don't even know what <laughs> does now. What, what does GSL even do these days? They just have games, and is it still oh behind a paywall? God. I don't know. I tried to turn never, on GSL geez. once, and there's like more pixels, <laughs> fucking never Japanese fucking, fucking pornography, than there is in the fucking GSL screen. So I'm not sure. Yeah. So I don't think anything will change. Hopefully, we'll just have higher quality broadcasts more often instead of <laughs> low quality crap and that sort of thing from time to time. And and uh, hopefully it won't be. Is it sub too? I don't even know if it's sub only or not behind a paywall or not. Hopefully it won't be. Uh, let's see. Wayne Lim asks, all right, Richard, Richard Lewis, do you think Riot will only go downhill from now? He's got a question for each of you guys. Do you think Riot will only go downhill from now? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's interesting. They're developing two new games at the moment. Yeah. Um, uh, which one of which is a first person shooter because obviously Blizzard are developing one. <laughs> so, uh, that's just, uh, that's how Riot, uh, operate. Um, but also as well, they are working on a sequel to League. They've made a couple of hires uh, based around that, which I wonder if that means they're going to code a game that, that isn't complete bollocks, uh, which would be incredible. Uh, so who knows? I guess it depends on the next two products. I think League of Legends in its current form, it has kind of plateaued. It has stagnated. That's one of the it's... reasons why they're looking at doing this um, franchise model, bringing in new sponsors. Uh, people want to invest in in. in uh, this because esports is coming up and LCS is still a highly desirable product even though they nearly fucked up the Coca-Cola sponsorship by basically taking I think it was like three million dollars from Coca-Cola and then only giving me a logo and not delivering any of the other promises they'd made privately so um, yeah it's interesting uh, I, I, don't, I don't think they're done yet by any stretch of the imagination but the good thing is now that the um, you know kind of player base of League of Legends, you know the numbers aren't shooting up. I haven't seen one of their pithy little demographics released for a while. Um, I, I think <laughs> I think we can assume that the average age of the League of Legends player is gonna ooh, it might have shot up to like 16 or something, uh, which means that they might be hitting this point of like critical thinking awareness, That's... which might make them take a long hard look at the company they're supporting. Oh, well, I thought Christ. I thought I thought originally they weren't planning on ever coming out with a sequel like they were just continually maintaining oh yeah yeah this, but, right? but, but come on this is riot man you've got a backpedal okay d d <laughs> it's the same company that promised a working replay system at launch and then announced it like in 2012 or whatever 2000 early 2013 nick allen did a little video there he was nah <laughs> that still hasn't happened does it sorry guys we're just full of shit riot what are you oh. gonna do all right, Semler, there's a question for you. CSGO greater than League of Legends in 2017? Hell, 2016. I'll throw that out. Wait, what bigger than League of Legends? CSGO. Oh. And what that was for Semler? What's, what's the context? In is it going to be bigger than League in 2016? Big, bigger in what? As an eSport? As a game? As a as, a, uh, as an eSport. eSport? I mean, game-wise, uh, that's... That'll be tough. It's, it's, this is one of those questions where it's like, let's speculate for 30 minutes or just say, fuck knows. <laughs> I mean, it's with the majors. Yeah, with the majors valve support. I mean, there's obvious drop off in viewership for League of Legends. There's nonstop growth for viewership in CSGO. 
Uh, I can't see why within two, you know two years, especially if Wall continues this 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 rate of decline, why we wouldn't be able to potentially surpass them on a day to day. Yeah. Uh, it seems like online, at least, if we're taking Twitch as a like if we're taking Twitch as the example, right? It seems like most days we're up there rivaling them already. Uh, and you would think, you know, that Riot are flipping out a little bit because considering the player base for CS:GO, which is what just cresting like the nine million unique per month, and like what what ungodly number do League of Legends have for for their player base? Uh, you know, how do you even compare that when we're getting the one point yeah. mm -hmm. one point X million watching our majors? When you're considering the player base versus you know the the hundred billion that Riot have, and they get like eh, you know like, it just doesn't compare at all. So I could see CS:GO just continuing this climb for at least another two years, or at least you know a solid another solid year of growth, and then maybe we start to to see that plateau coming. Yeah, I mean, so. and keep in mind we haven't even cracked the Asian market yet. Fuck yeah, that's right. I mean, that's the thing. Like, Riot are Riot are firing with all the guns right now. You know, they've mm -hmm. got you know China, they got Korea, they got you know they got have everything right. Whereas us, we're still still struggling to set up servers in places, let alone, you know, get into the Asian market. Holy God, that would yeah, be... I mean, like if, Riot we had, if we had an actual CSGO in China. Yeah, Riot aggressively <laughs> oh went after that the Asian market. They, they, they slandered and smeared uh, Dota as much as they could and even filed, uh, like, nuisance um, patent claims and all sorts of other fucked up shit uh, just to try and stall the growth of Dota in that eastern region. Um, so they, they really aggressively went after that market share. CSGO hasn't. I mean, I, I still think the, the secret of cracking the uh, Asian market is to go free to play. I say it. People don't like yeah. it when I say it. But I, I, think, I think if we ever do decide to do that and we do conquer the Asian market, which I think we would, uh, it, then our game can easily go up uh, a few more gears, you know. It's just it's the FP. It's again, it's the free to play model. It always comes back down to this: the free to play model and the PC bangs and how that operates, right? You have CS:GO Online free. You have, I always forget this fucking game's name. What is it called? Uh, the on the the free to play game that's played a shitload in Korea and in China. What's it called? Uh, Instant Attack or something like that. Crossfire or Sudden Death? Is it, is it Crossfire? It sounds that sounds like something, right? Okay, it's in that line, right? But the, like these mm. games are huge. Yeah, Scoots is possibly not a crossfire, right? Like these games are are fucking huge, and so like there is a demand for the FPS model there. They just mm. don't. But it's the pay barrier. It's the it's the fact that you have to get through there, and then also find somebody who's actually going to deliver the product to the people in Asia as well. You know, something like the what is it, Perfect World that they have for Dota Two? Uh, do we have something similar set up for CS:GO? Or, you know, that's these are all questions that need answers before we can even start thinking about, OK, do we just restructure the model and actually start trying to crack on and get into China and get yeah. into South Korea? Uh, doesn't seem to us, at least, that like CSGO is anywhere near that point yet. So yeah. that's that's what's holding us back. I think if we could actually because look at all these numbers, right? You know, it's like from the Western world, you know, it's just like shit viewership, basically, for all these major events like the international uh, and probably everything that's coming in on the League of Legends, like World's Affair. Uh, the vast majority of their viewership, it's all coming either from like the CIS region or from Asia, depending on which event yeah. we're talking about. Right. And so we're not getting any of that right now with CSGO or, or just like a very sh slim margin. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Pretty scary how big you can get. Uh, Destiny, yours is StarCraft 3. That's all it says. What would Blizzard need to do to revive StarCraft scene? I don't know. StarCraft, Haven't we have this question literally every Starcraft single fucking 3. episode? StarCraft 3 is going to be like another... Chadman just likes to hear you reiterate it, huh? Hey, I'm just asking a, a, a question from our viewers, man. It's like it'd be uncool for me to cut that portion of it off. Okay. Wait, Scoots, <laughs> you have a suit now? Damn, son. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. He's got a suit? Go of course he has a suit. What do you mean? Everybody has a suit, right? Don't forget Heroes of nah, the Storm. I think he said sweet. He's got his own sweet somewhere. You oh, mean, so that was oh that my, he can't even about. read. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What's in that vase? I own sweet. Yeah, I know, exactly. Okay, so uh, sweet. a question about so Overwatch. So there's been a lot of talk about um, there's been a lot of talk about just some of the content makers slash influencers going to Blizzard this week and um, you know, giving a chance to even stream some Overwatch, uh, so just preview Overwatch. And I've heard that, you know, Overwatch has been, I mean, or at least the team that, you know, they've been taking a look at, at people from the CSGO community, also people from the Team Fortress community, and, um, you know, trying to see if they, they'll try out Overwatch and maybe, you know, just have them immediately start into maybe a competitive scene in Overwatch. What do you guys think about that game? Is that game um, a competitor to CSGO, or is it just a complete separate thing? 
Richard? I don't see it as a competitor. Hmm. I, mean, I, I, I don't see how uh, class-based shooters are ever going to really do particularly well. Like I've always said, the best thing about um, CSGO is it's simple to, to understand, but it's very complex to play at a high level. Um, and <laughs> that's the, the, They're the best qualities you need to have in an eSport. Now, uh, when you've got class-based stuff and special abilities, and it's not just an aim-based game, and you're going to need synergy and, and, and tactics just right from the get-go, that's definitely a barrier to entry. Uh, just traditionally, class-based shooters have never really translated well in the esports arena, either from a broadcasting perspective or in terms of having large player bases. So I, I, I think this is just another one of those things where it's like Blizzard are now trying to make esports games, and the esports games they're making aren't going to be successful esports, hmm. whereas the games they didn't make to be esports titles mm. were. Boom, right, Hearthstone, right? right? <laughs> Steven, what do you think? Overwatch. Potentially. Um, I have to wait until it's been played more. Like, it, I, I don't know. Are they really trying to make this an esport? Or is this just. I thought this was supposed to be like another Team Fortress 2. It yeah, like, is supposed to be another Team Fortress 2, but I mean, of well, course, yeah, esports. ever considered uh, a serious esport? It, it wasn't, was it? Could be wrong. Fortress? But... I mean, it, it's always had a scene. Like, ESEA have been. Well, everything yeah. has a I mean, Tic Tac Toe right? has a scene, but I mean, like, has it. Okay. okay. <laughs> but has but Valve hasn't ever treated it like a, an esports. I mean, if a dev actually went into it from the get go and wanted it to be esports, is like a marketing tool now, right? So every every dev is going look looking at their game as a, a potential esport or at least starting events for the, for this for their it's game. Still a so, isn't it? Yeah, it is. The, the, we have that's, to esports. We have to exactly. So I mean, with with this, you know, Blizzard's probably ramping up a lot of things for esports with Heroes and and. Uh, even StarCraft 2 and Hearthstone and and Overwatch. Come on, Overwatch seems to be seems to be a very likely candidate for for the same thing. It's we learned this lesson with BLC. It's 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 a lesson that's been learned from since time immemorial. It is you don't build a game to be an esport. You build it to be a fun game, and right. the and the esports will come. Yeah, I mean, I don't Whatever. think the competitive I mean, scene will come. Like, yeah, if you're going into it thinking we're gonna build. I mean, you had BLC was still a successful game. It never yeah. took off and was this massive game that took over everything. But it was still a successful game as far as the developers were concerned, and they managed to make money off of it. It sustained them, and they kept. They went on to make more games. Yeah. Perfect, you know, situation for them. But that was a game that was designed to be an esport right from the get-go, and it's just you're you're going to have too high a barrier of entry. The learning curve is too steep. You're never really going to be able to appeal to the casual market where that's where you're going to make your Skrilla. That's where you're going to make your money. Mm -hmm. And so, Blizzard would be absolutely insane if they were even considering actually putting any time into esports right off the bat. Like well, I'm not focus saying focus on making it a fun game. Oh, yeah, of course their main focus, focus is going to be follow, that, but right? they of course their main focus is that, but they they obviously it, will have a couple of chance. Does it stand a chance though? I I don't see it. Richard basically, yeah, that's why I was going like this. I was like praise, you know, praise the Lord, Gaben, you know, I don't know, but like this guy Richard just was hitting all the points. We just have to wait and see how the, how the game like actually like plays out. Like it's impossible to say until we start seeing it like Yeah. play out, you know. Yeah. Personally, I think um I think CS:GO is kind of like a I think CSGO is kind of like an off game to make it as an esport because I do think that CSGO is like, in some ways, it's a little bit more complicated than a normal shooter. Um, actually, CSGO is significantly more complicated than the than like the Call of Duty shooter today and that the aiming mechanics of CSGO are so much different than what you would expect today. And like CSGO, or not CSGO, um, Call of Duty shooters are very like quick. Like you can run and sprint very quickly everywhere and you can sure. jump around and you're very, and that you, your gun comes up instantly and you're always shooting and yeah. everything can be scoped. And like CSGO plays out much more differently than that, but it's still very, very, very successful for, I mean, in some ways it's simple on that there aren't 50 million weapons and there aren't 50 million classes and everybody just buys the same guns. And uh, It's successful on all fronts. Just yeah. think about the investment for uh, for Valve to actually make CS:GO run compared to Dota, like it's their it's it's the highest profit margin for them across the company on any project I think that they work on at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sure. yeah, it's massively successful CS:GO. It's not getting around that. All right. Well, let's wrap up because Rich and I got to get going here. Uh, similar. Yeah, sorry, my bad, guys. Been Different great week. having you on, buddy. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll uh, have you come on again. But uh, let's do some shots. Well, I don't know if uh, Steve, Steven might, you know, revolt considering like three quarters of the show was <laughs> CS, CS Talk. <laughs> well, he plays like, CSGO. It's just. Uh, I, I've watched. I know, I know. You I know. watched? Oh, wow. We'll get, What's we'll that get supposed there, to mean? Actually. Whoa, what rank are you? What do you think, bro? I don't know. Like, what we're going to have like a rank off? Like, <laughs> well, no, I'm just curious. Well, Danny said that all fucking <laughs> derogatorily. Like, I don't know. What the fuck? Fuck no. I mean, I've watched your stream, man, and it was a good time. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, there was no there was no barb hidden in there. No, oh, okay. All right. I, I'm just I'm on the show with Richard Lewis You're so much. Right. I just I never know when there's like a text coming from all ends. Like, oh, <laughs> exactly. Out, so. yeah, clearly, man, that's not home. No, okay. Oh god. But uh <laughs> thanks for having me for the show, guys. Yeah. You, Anders and I like uh what we've been in hotel rooms for the past two weeks and it's just like we're we I think we've like rewatched both of the last episodes twice over now. So <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks, uh thanks for entertaining us and thanks for having me. Cheers, no Richard? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, usual shit. Thanks to Samler. Can't wait to work with him again. Uh, it's always an, uh, fun. Lots of stories that never get told. Cluj <laughs> uh, uh, is going to be the big one. Like, I, I, I definitely, uh, it's the only event, really, I, I've kind of even felt sort of slight pressure going into it. So I, I hope we all knock it out the park, and I'm sure we will. Uh, and it'll be a nice little sort of, uh, there you go, ESL. Look at what you could have had. That's in what uh, three we weeks? Doing? Three I can't weeks? Even, like that's that's yeah, the, all, that, all that bullshit. Yeah, okay. All that that dick waving needs to go the fuck out. Like, well, so I, 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 I agree. I show. agree. But I, what 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 better way to do it than by just this? This is the demonstration that proves if we get rid of the dick waving, look at what we can have. Look at what our community can have, right? So, and obviously we'll get we'll definitely get a woman caster in there. At some point. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, and just obviously thanks to all the fan fans. Thanks to all the people that uh, you know make this show possible and. Uh, subscribe to the unfiltered Patreon and buy the razors that Destiny advertises or whatever. So. <laughs> the razors. All right, Stephen. But thanks for watching. Thanks for having me on. I love you all very much. Awesome. And I uh, just close things out. Thanking the three of you guys. Um, it's always great having you on. We always talk about unfiltered, so uh, might as well just like naturally have you on. So uh, whenever we'll you want, man. Out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next week, I don't know who the guest is quite yet for next week, but we definitely have a line of people coming on that you guys are going to definitely love. Uh, like Richard said, support the Patreon guy, pa Patreons, patreon.com slash unfiltered. Uh, I kind of switched up some of the milestone rewards to, I, I think, fit a little bit better, but check that out. We did clear our first milestone, so we will be having T-shirts uh, made for just the fans, and I'm going to have like very exclusive ones for the patrons uh, that we will be giving to you guys. You don't have to buy. So uh, check that out, too. And I think that's going to be it, guys. VODs will be up soon, and audios, too. But until next week, for Assembler, Richard Lewis, Destiny, and myself, Cham MV, we'll see you next week. Later. <laughs>